Well, and there were ceremonies both private and public today in Memphis, Tennessee, where Elvis Presley was buried. Ed Rabel has this report. Only relatives, close friends, and some celebrities were permitted to enter Graceland, the Presley estate, to witness the funeral services. Anne Margaret, Burke Reynolds, John Wayne, Chet Atkins, Charlie Pride, Caroline Kennedy, all were reported to be in town. As described to artist Ham Embry, Presley was dressed in a white suit, blue shirt, and tie. Presley's former wife Priscilla and his father Vernon were among those to view Presley for the last time. The somber funeral procession moved slowly down the driveway and out onto Elvis Presley Boulevard for the three and a half mile drive to Forest Hill Cemetery. Just as it emerged, a young woman jumped in front of the hearse carrying Presley's body. Authorities pulled her out of the way. The police escorted motorcade moved on without incident, passing grieving Presley admirers who had gathered lining the boulevard five deep. Still more thousands of Presley's fans were waiting when the procession arrived at the cemetery. Presley was to be entombed in this one-story marble mausoleum. On the front lawn, flowers sent by the truckload by Presley followers were arranged in profusion. One was in the form of a six-foot-long guitar. Presley's crypt is in the so-called Presley Room, where other family members will eventually be entombed. His crypt will always be visible to the public through a locked wrought iron door. Officials believe Presley will continue to attract, in death, many of those who were so devoted to him when he was alive. Ed Rabel, CBS News, Memphis. CBS News will present a special broadcast on Elvis Presley immediately following this 11 o'clock report. Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of a lonely street, that heartbreak hotel. You didn't have to like Elvis Presley. A lot of people didn't. But on the night of his funeral, there is a life to look back on. Some of it can be measured in numbers. 400 million records sold. 33 movies, the biggest three of which grossed something like $36 million in the United States and Canada alone. The best-selling recording artist of all time, he was called, and the most highly paid entertainer of all time. But some of that life lies beyond statistics, an influence, musical and otherwise, that shaped an era and fired a revolution. Only the man died Tuesday. What he symbolized and what he created are still with us. This is a CBS News special report. Elvis. Here is CBS News correspondent Charles Kuralt. Good evening. Elvis Presley was buried today amid scenes that reflected the birth of his gaudy career 21 years ago. Fans sobbed and wept. All that emotion reminded us that he was a man who influenced millions of lives but couldn't control his own. He put on weight in recent years, became reclusive. There were rumors of drug abuse, although the coroner said he found no sign of that. What we are left with is a life that was the stuff of fables. The world didn't notice his birth in a two-room shack, but it noticed his death on radio and television and front pages here and all over Europe. The President of the United States expressed his sorrow. The money-making machine that was part of the Presley legend ground on. Record stores sold out of his albums. The nation's biggest 16-millimeter film distributor reported the biggest day in its history as fans clamored for Presley movies. And Elvis Presley, country boy, died in a mansion on a street that was named for him. Ed Rabel was at the funeral This in Mississippi River town that once gave birth to the Beale Street Blues is still mourning the death of its most famous citizen. Thousands from other cities and towns came here to share in the grief of Memphis. Last night, two teenage girls who had come all the way from Louisiana were killed by a speeding car as they stood in the crowd that lined Elvis Presley Boulevard. Police stopped the car and arrested the driver who witnesses said had intentionally swerved into the crowd. It was terrible. It was awful. It was a nightmare. I think it's horrible. It's terrible. I don't see who, who could do something like this. Why did you stay after the accident? I've been here for two days. I come as soon as I heard Elvis died, all the way from Pittsburgh. I couldn't leave for nothing. Though they knew his funeral was to be private, many thousands of Presley's admirers were still outside his home this morning, hoping that somehow they might get in. But only relatives, close friends, and some celebrities were allowed into the 14-acre estate Presley called Graceland. 150 people from show business had been invited. 
and Margaret, Burt Reynolds, John Wayne, and many others reportedly came. Cameras and news people were kept from the service, which lasted more than an hour. Afterwards, led by 10 white Cadillacs, the funeral procession left Graceland for the three and a half mile drive to Memphis Forest Hill Cemetery. It was repeatedly delayed by mourners who broke through police lines to try to get close to the hearse which carried Presley's body. At the cemetery, some fans tried to get closer to the mausoleum where Presley was to be entombed, but were pushed back by authorities. Funeral flowers sent to Presley by admirers filled the lawn in front of the marble mausoleum. Inside, a cubicle called the Presley Room had been ready to receive the coffin. Eventually, other Presley family members would also be interred here. The crypt for Presley's body was covered with a black silk curtain. The crypt will always be visible to the public through a locked wrought iron door. Six pallbearers carried Presley's body in a seamless copper coffin to its final resting place. Later, the mourners emerged composed but pale. Elvis Presley's family, his close friends, and his devoted followers had all paid their last respects. Ed Rabel, CBS News, Memphis. There were clearly carnival aspects to the public mourning of Elvis Presley today. The hawking of souvenirs in the streets recalled the early days of the legend when a whole new youth market opened up for Elvis t-shirts and Elvis bubblegum cards and pictures of Elvis that glowed in the dark. In the ten years before his death, all that seemed part of the past. Those of us who didn't attend his concerts might have forgotten him except as a relic so that some of today's grief seemed contrived. But all these years, as many as 4,000 letters a day continued to arrive at Elvis Presley Fan Club headquarters in Madison, Tennessee. And some of the loyalists came to Memphis today. Elvis Presley Boulevard, outside the main gates of Graceland, is largely deserted tonight. The vigil held by thousands of people is over. Bouquets of flowers decorate the entrance to the huge estate, where Presley's body was viewed by more than 20,000 persons, people he knew well, people he had never even met. Shortly after Presley was buried, the street cleaners began clearing away the refuse of an enormous crowd. The thousands of mourning Presley fans who had converged on Memphis came from all over the nation. Most of them were not wealthy, and so they had to drive for long hours over hundreds of miles, some in battered autos. They packed up the kids and the family dog, even left their jobs to be here. One family from Indiana, living off Social Security, spent $300 on the trip. The, the cost didn't seem Presley's to matter. They were all now. drawn to Presley in death as they had been drawn to him in life. I think it was the greatest. It was what I think. There'll never be another one like him. But to me, he'll, he'll live in the hearts of people forever. Uh, it took us about 16 hours. Didn't miss it. You <laughs> can't believe the people here. Other than that, you know, rock and roll never forget. <laughs> and how do you feel? Awful. Like a, a something died. A part of me died. Why a part of you? Because ever since I was 11, I love just music. I love Tim. And just part of you's gone when he's gone. On this final day of mourning, the large crowd attracted the merchants the who have sought to capitalize on the deep Presley sentiments. Elvis Presley Memorial T-shirts were selling for five dollars. How's business going with these T-shirts? Oh, it's going great. It really is. But people are getting something more than a T-shirt. They're getting uh, an experience, and then they're getting something that they can remember Elvis. Bob, I think Elvis would have probably liked it. You know, and he probably does. You know, I think his spirit, his uh, you know uh, consciousness, probably is around. Because I don't think you destroy that. I think that keeps going after the body deceases. <laughs> there were even specially made up pennants, souvenirs that are usually sold at sporting events. If some events surrounding Presley's funeral seem somewhat unusual, even incongruous, perhaps irreverent, it might have been because of how these people perceived Presley himself. A person, not unlike them, from a simple background, who managed to climb above the confines of little education and poverty, to become a heroic figure. His mourners today smiled more than they cried. Chris Kelly, CBS News, Memphis. Memphis took pride in Elvis Presley, partly, some said, because he never went Hollywood, except to go out there to make a few pictures. He always returned home to Graceland, his 14-acre estate. And as they buried him today, it was hard to remember just how profoundly he helped change some things in American life. 
Until he came along, the young people in the 1950s were called the silent generation. Whatever else became of them after that, they weren't silent. Not after hearing that voice singing those songs. Spider-Man played a little saxophone Little Joe was blowing on the slide trombone Drummer for the metal for the crash boom bang The whole rhythm section was a purple gang Let's rock Everybody let's rock Number three, are you the cutest jailbird I ever did see? I sure would be delighted with your company. Come on and do the jail, hide a rock with me. Let's rock. Go, go, go! Everybody, let's rock. Lay it on me, daddy-o! Everybody, you know, let's rock. We're dancing to the jail, rock. In looking at his life, you have to start with the fact of his name. It was perfect for fame giving him an instant idiosyncratic identity, like those other public figures of the 1950s, Adlai and Tallulah. You never heard anybody ask, Elvis who? He was born Elvis Aaron Presley, January 8, 1935, in Tupelo, Mississippi. A twin brother died at birth. Those were hard times, depression times. His father, Vernon, was a truck driver and day laborer. Gladys Presley pampered her only child. Recreation was music at the Pentecostal First Assembly of God Church. Since I was two years old, Elvis Presley once said, all I knew was gospel music. We used to go to those religious singings all the time. He won his first singing contest at a fair when he was 10. And the next year, his mother bought him his first guitar. He carted it around, playing, he said, like somebody beaten on a bucket lid. The family moved to Memphis when Elvis was 13. We were broke, man, broke. And we left Tupelo overnight. We just headed for Memphis. Things had to be better. Memphis music then was hillbilly and blues. Elvis hung around with musicians of both races. He majored in shop at Humes High School, got kicked off the football team, perhaps for growing sideburns, and was remembered by a classmate as having character but no personality. He was 18 in 1953 a $40 a week truck driver when he started paying $2 a side to record at Sam Phillips' Sun Studio. In 1954, one of those songs, a conventional blues called That's All Right, took off. That's all right to you. That's all right to mama. Just anyway. Sometime in 1955, he hooked up with Colonel Tom Parker of the Great Parker Pony Circus, who later said, when I met the boy, all he had was a million dollars worth of talent. Now he's got a million dollars. When he went into the army, got married, became a father, got divorced, all of that was news. Because, as somebody said, Elvis had the moment. He hit like a Pan American flash, and the reverberations still linger from the shock of his arrival. He was, somebody else said, supremely a man of the time. The time, by the way, was not now, and not like now. The time was different, only 20 years ago, but so far away now that it seems impossible we lived through it. When Elvis Presley first stepped sneering onto the stage of our memory, ducktail and sideburns and leather jacket and vulgar arrogance, he seemed to a lot of people of normal sensibilities to be revolting. And when he switched to red, white, and blue and sequins and spangles and a Superman cape, he seemed a joke. Whatever this was, it wasn't music. We didn't know music was about to change. He was about to change it. We were about to change, too. How could we have known that? Try to remember. Try to remember. 1956 was the year Elvis Presley made his first national impact. Ike was in his glory, and Grace was in her palace, and all was right with the world. Except that an Alabama preacher named Martin Luther King didn't think so. He helped lead a boycott in Montgomery against the well-established idea that blacks should sit at the back of the bus. Some things were beginning in 1956. Elvis Presley was widely considered to be a passing fad. We were becoming accustomed to flashes in the pan, like the Davy Crockett hat and the hula hoop. A few more shakes of the hip, and Elvis would be gone. But he didn't go. Well-considered adult ideas, like the Edsel, failed miserably. 
The best American minds could not for the longest time seem to put a satellite in space to match the Russian Sputnik. The American space effort in those early years produced failure after failure. While so many of the sincere best efforts of grown-ups flopped, Elvis Presley, this unlikely phenomenon of youth, succeeded gaudily. We're just trying to put Elvis Presley into the context of his time by trying to remember what else became big at about the time he did. Jet planes, tail fins, instant coffee, power mowers, electric typewriters, princess phones. You see, grown-ups had fads too, but they were bland and innocent beside this boy with the curled lips and the pulsing hips. We turned to Vance Packard, the author who started in the 50s explaining us to ourselves to help explain what it was about Elvis Presley. Did Elvis Presley come along um, and take advantage of something that was about to happen anyway? Yes, I think that this was happening all along the, the line. Uh, the uh, Not only music, but uh, in, in sexual mores and, and the way that people dress. I mean, uh, in the, up until, well, in the late 50s, uh, the gray flannel suit was still mandatory for men, or, or and with it, and uh, they had very strong ideas about even changing the buttons on a on a suit. And the women wore dresses, and and uh, there was only a, a narrow range in which they could raise and lower the hem. The idea of the woman's rule was that that, that uh, she had the the station wagon full of kids out in the suburbs, uh, taking them off to school, and this was glorified all through America. But Elvis Presley burst on a rather quiet, tame American scene. Did he actually help change things? Well, he, he helped change the sexual uh, mores in terms of restraints, I think. I think that uh, he was a, a key figure in this. I mean, with his uh, uh, sensuality and his, and his, and his uh, great bursting away from restraint and the way he presented himself in all of his songs, I mean, that was, that was the biggest characteristic. And it was a that gave the people, the millions of people watched him, permission to break loose from the, the inhibitions that they'd had. It wasn't just years ago, it was ages. When Elvis Presley got out of the Army in 1960, one of the reporters who sat down to interview him was a 25-year-old CBS News correspondent. Good heavens, that's me. Elvis, you have some screaming fans out there. Do you still like screaming girls? <laughs> If it wasn't for them, I'd, uh, I'd have to re-up in the army, so I'll tell you. <laughs> well, it was all so long ago. There's a thousand pretty women waiting out there. They're all living the devil may care. And I am just a devil with no spare. Viva Las Vegas! Quite apart from his music, Elvis Presley seems to have built his persona from the movies he saw when he worked as an usher. Tony Curtis's Ducktail, Marlon Brando's Truculence, James Dean's Vulnerability. When the collage was assembled, show business paid the ultimate tribute. In 1960, it made a Broadway musical, Bye Bye Birdie, about the Presley phenomenon. The film version followed three years later. <laughs> Gotta be sincere. What's wrong? You gotta be sincere. Bertie, what are you doing? You gotta feel it here. Cause if you feel it here, well, then you're gonna be honestly sincere. <laughs> What you feel is true, you really feel it, you make them feel it too. <laughs> Write this down now, you gotta be sincere, honestly sincere. Man, you gotta be sincere. Elvis Presley, we're told, didn't invent rock and roll, but gave it a style. He did more than that. He gave the world of show business a style. Twenty years later, that style still nourishes the theater and movies and television. Without Elvis Presley, there'd be no Grease, a musical about the 1950s, which is the longest-running show on Broadway. 
The movie American Graffiti is about teenagers lost in the 50s. And television's The Fonz is clearly cast in the Presley image. After his death, people who knew him reflected on the man and the style that had such an impact on American life. Pat Boone, the singer whose career roughly paralleled Presley's in time, was a close friend. Elvis uh, really was a, just a simple down-home southern boy, you know, from Mississippi and Tennessee. Uh, I don't think he ever really got to develop socially a lot because he had to live such a, a fugitive kind of life. And uh, he kept the same little group of people around him all the time. He had to live behind bars or behind security guards. Do you think his having to be in seclusion all of, all of that time made him more generous, more outgoing when he could relate to people? Yeah, but I, it was, those seemed like acts of, of desperation almost, like trying to uh, uh, reach out and, and be involved with real people. But he was never with them very long. It was always just a passing thing. And, uh, and so he'd give a guy a Cadillac to let him know that he really appreciated him. And I think it was more than that. I think he was trying to say somehow, gee, I'd like to have a normal kind of existence. I'd like to have a friend like you. I'd like to feel that, uh, that I had a relationship with somebody that, that was not based on the fact that I'm the king and you're a commoner. And so I'm going to give you something to, to sort of demonstrate that. Marlo Lewis was the producer when Presley made his stormy first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1956. Well, we were electrified by, uh, and he was electrifying, I should say, by uh, the very gyrations of his body. He had a kind of a call of the wild, uh, a sexuality, a sensuality, a lasciviousness to his music, and it communicated immediately to the audience. To rock and roll. Mrs. Marion Cock, a nurse, cared for Elvis Presley when he was treated over the years at Baptist Memorial Hospital in Memphis. Elvis was not afraid of dying. He was a deeply religious person, and he uh, read a lot of uh, up on astrology. He was very smart. Uh, he, as I said, he was not afraid to die. George Klein was Elvis Presley's best friend in high school and a pallbearer at the funeral today. We, we were friends and I was always nice to him. And he, he never forgot that. He, he said that uh, he always remembered. <laughs> what about this ring you have out on your finger there now? Is that, is that a good one? He gave me that ring for my birthday. He gave me that watch. He gave me that bracelet. He gave me everything I had. The best thing he ever gave me was friendship. The remarks weren't always so kind during Presley's lifetime. A movie critic said Presley was sensitively cast as a slob. A religious newspaper said Presley and his voodoo of frustration and defiance have become a symbol in our country. It was even written, Mr. Presley has no discernible singing ability. That was written 400 million records ago. Some guys have all the luck, but my heart hasn't any. I think I'll paint a sign for sale for a penny. Yeah. Who wants to buy a heart? My poor heart. One broken heart. Yeah. One broken heart. Since his death, there's been so much talk about Elvis Presley as symbol, Elvis Presley's significance to our culture, that it's almost possible to forget that he played a guitar and sang. Whatever else went into the Presley legend, it began with his music. Charles Osgood reports. This is the heart of that part of New York City they used to call Tin Pan Alley. Most of America's pop music came from here until something explosive happened in the 1950s. It was an extraordinary sort of eruptive uh, uh, impact on American society. You, if you go back and listen to what was on the hit parade in the early 1950s in this country, it is appalling. It's like a time warp. I mean, uh, but it was a time of extraordinary 
gentility and blandness and politeness. Uh, Presley was the man who codified in the American consciousness a kind of rebellion. And that rebellion was as much in the stage manner and inflections of the voice. I mean, that man could sort of shake his voice and suggest sex in a way that a literal readout of the words would never necessarily imply. Well, it's one for the money. The shaking voice and hips offended parents no end. Presley didn't invent rock any more than he invented sex, but kids seemed to think he'd invented both. And to the world of music, he became, to say the least, important. You bet you he was, Charlie. He was immensely important. He was important because he was the first white man or woman to combine the basic elements of hillbilly music and rhythm and blues, and uh, he became a kind of a rockabilly character and with uh, the, sub the seductiveness that was available to him, and especially at the time which, in which he was born, culturally, in our evolutionary process, he was a, a major and significant man. He changed the course of music, as I say, uh, uh, by introducing a, a shocking, at that time, a shocking kind of launch into the musical bloodstream. You You have to realize how insulting and crude and upsetting this was in a culture in which one expressed romantic feelings with moon June platitudes. Uh, I mean, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, the use of the colloquial ain't. I mean, of course, this stuff had been going on in black music and in, and in the, uh, the scuzzier kinds of country music for years, but, but with Elvis's significance, apart from his musical gifts, which were in his formative years formidable as an interpreter, apart from that, he was the conduit through which these underground musics suddenly, and it was sudden, suddenly found themselves in the mainstream. The style of uh, Elvis Presley was influenced tremendously by, by um, black performers, and uh, he, in essence, uh, because of at that particular time, the kind of backwards uh, mental capability that many people had as uh, judging a person because of the color of their skin as somewhat still does exist. But back then it was uh, worse and uh, he actually because of uh, him being um, a Caucasian brother he was able to uh, to do away with that whole thing. When word of Presley's death came, there was a rush on his records. You can't even buy one here now. They're all sold out. But this store itself is a reflection of how much music has changed since the heyday of in Pan Alley. David Bowie, The Stones, The Band, The Kiss. The rock world as we know it today came into being when that explosive event occurred in the mid-1950s. Its name was Elvis Presley. Charles Osgood, CBS News, New York. He gave away Cadillacs to total strangers. I know somebody he gave one to. Now that's success. Raw, garish American success. Success without limits. Success so grand and complete as a critic named Greil Marcus once wrote that there is nothing else worth striving for. The reports from overseas tonight speak of mourning rituals all over Europe. He was an idol over there, too. But it's hard to imagine Elvis Presley's success coming anywhere else but here. He molded it out of so many American elements, country and blues and gospel and rock, a little Memphis, a little Vegas, a little arrogance, a little piety. Greil Marcus says Elvis Presley's strength was nothing less than a rich and commonplace understanding of what democracy and equality are all about. No man is better than I am. He was a truck driver's boy from Tupelo who got so rich he could give away Cadillacs. That's an American story. How could we ever have felt estranged from Elvis? He was a native son. This is Charles Kiralt. Good night. This has been the CBS News Special Report.
Elvis. Are you lonesome tonight? Do you miss me tonight? Are you sorry we drew? We wish to thank Columbia Pictures for the use of Bye Bye Birdie and Metro Goldwyn Mayer for the use of excerpts from several films. These CBS stations provided news film and tape for this broadcast. This is CBS.